Good afternoon. I'm Doug Wood from the University of Washington in Seattle, and I have some expert panelists with me today to talk about lung cancer screening and its impact for thoracic surgery and for the, the field of thoracic oncology. I'd like to have the panelists go around and introduce themselves so you can see uh, who's going to be involved in our discussion, and then we'll talk about the different aspects of lung cancer screening for cardiothoracic surgeons today. Gail Darling, University of Toronto, Toronto, Canada. John Howington, North Shore University Health System in Evanston, Illinois. Gaetano Rocco, National Cancer Institute, Naples, Italy. John Mitchell, University of Colorado, in Aurora, Colorado. And I'm Frank Detterbeck, a thoracic surgeon at uh, Yale University in Connecticut. So we're very privileged to have a great group of experts that know a lot about thoracic surgery, uh, lung cancer, and now lung cancer screening. And certainly the arena of lung cancer screening has been changing since the recent publication of the National Lung Screening Trial. And Dr. Howington, I'm wondering if you can tell us how the National Lung Screening Trial is affecting how hospitals are developing screening programs. So for our particular program at North Shore, we uh, were a member of the ILCAP study. We now are no longer continuing that study, but actually have a now fully developed uh, lung cancer screening program. We call it a pulmonary nodule clinic, but where patients that fit the criteria for the National Lung Screening Trial, so 55 to uh, 75, and smoke a pack a day for 25 years or more, they uh, can come in, typically have an order from their primary care physician, get a CT screen, and uh, be screened. Um, so it's not part of a clinical trial now. We have a proving, proven uh, cancer survival benefit of 20% higher than other screening trials in breast cancer or colon cancer, so a dramatic benefit. So we think it's ready for prime time. Uh, the cases where we think there are suspicious nodules are reviewed in a multidisciplinary conference so it's not just me or a pulmonologist looking at it, but radiology and, uh, you know, having an algorithm for what we do for the different nodules and the nurse practitioners are aware of, aware of that. We have patient education, so they're aware that if you have a small nodule, not to get too distressed. Um, that, that's most often background noise and not to be worried about. Thank you. And I'll, I'll, I'll turn to Frank Detterbeck and ask, what's your experience in how patients or referring physicians are handling the issue of lung cancer screening today. Are you seeing uh, new referrals or patients that are seeking out a screening? How, what's your experience at Yale? Well, so uh, we, we certainly see uh, physicians that are sending patients and we see patients that are calling up and uh, asking and are interested in it. At the same time, I am a bit surprised at how slow the acceptance and, and I think dissemination of information has been among physicians in the community. I think that uh, you know we have a very large trial that shows a pretty dramatic benefit uh, and I think that information has been a little bit slow to really get out there. Now, I think there are some aspects that may also be part of that. I think that uh, uh, there is a little bit of complexity around it and uh, you know certainly there's some anxiety I think anxiety managed from from the patients uh, of the patients is uh, something that uh, perhaps some people are a little reluctant to get too involved with but uh, uh, we see it it's certainly building we see more and more patients but uh, at the same time it's not building as much as I would have thought <clears throat> yes yeah, so I think I'd like to come back to that a little bit later because I think that is an important issue for us to discuss. Uh, I'm interested in information from Dr. Darling and Dr. Rocco because we have some international members of this panel and I'd be interested in what's happening in Canada uh, regarding lung cancer screening. How has the National Lung Screening Trial affected the development of screening programs in Canada? Well, I think many centers are adopting the screening trial guidelines, and they're doing it kind of on an individual center-by-center -center basis. Uh, in my own province in Ontario, uh, it has 
is still being questioned how we're going to roll it out on a population-wide level. But uh, doctors and patients are impatient, and they're not waiting for the official approval. And so individual hospitals and centers are developing their own programs. And Dr. Rocco, uh, what's happening in Italy? You're at the National Cancer Institute yes. of Italy in Naples. and. What is the, the impact in Italy and how are patients being referred or how are screening programs being developed in Italy? Well, the screening programs uh, in Italy have uh, been developed by uh, uh, the uh, in National Institute uh, of uh, Health uh, and uh, from some uh, uh, other institutions like the European Institute of Oncology. And they are part of a bigger effort uh, in Europe of uh, uh, six to uh, now seven uh, uh, centers that have, uh, or countries that have contributed uh, to the uh, uh, low density CT screening trials. The um, uh, major concern that we have in Europe uh, is to refine the category of high risk patients, and we are uh, more and more uh, thinking about uh, um, uh, creating uh, 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 criteria and looking at criteria that could be uh, wider, and including a genomic signature, uh, including uh, uh, the, um, uh, the other parameters that have been already uh, introduced into clinical uh, uh, practice by the guidelines of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. Dr. Mitchell, um, as programs are being developed, uh, what's your opinion on how formally or informally that should be done? Uh, just in this discussion, we've heard uh, a couple of different aspects with a relatively ad hoc development by hospitals in Canada. Uh, and Dr. Howington talked about a pretty formalized program that they have at uh, North Shore University Health System. How do you think that this ought to be rolled out if someone is considering developing a lung cancer screening program in terms of how formal it should be? Well, Doug, I, I think that there are a number of elements uh, that are really required for a successful uh, lung cancer screening program. And in general, I think it be should be a fairly formalized process. Some of the elements uh, might include the selection criteria for patients that are going to be screened. The NLST is a good start there, but uh, uh, perhaps we could debate the possibility of expanding that pool of patients uh, for screening. Uh, you're going to need to have uh, regimented protocols about uh, uh, how the CT scan is done, how it is interpreted, and what you do with the interpretation, how you manage the patients from that point forward. Patient education is a big thing. Smoking cessation, I think, is a very important component of any lung cancer screening program. So there are a number of features that I think need to be emphasized. Finally, I should add, you need to have a comprehensive set of clinicians that are going to be able to deal with the outcomes of the screening, and that includes uh, thoracic surgeons that are going to be capable of intervening when appropriate. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn that same question to Dr. Howington because I heard some of how he's organized a program uh, in Evanston, so I'm interested in um, whether you think that this is reproducible in other centers, uh, do you have smoking cessation program as part of your lung cancer screening program? And who is the group of experts that evaluate the nodules and make decisions about uh, follow-up studies or inter the interval or, or decisions for biopsy or intervention? Right. So um, we do have a, an associated uh, smoking cessation program that's run out of our uh, pharmacy program and our pharmacy residency program, so uh, well supported. Um, and then uh, it's a team approach, so it's both out of the Division of Pulmonary Medicine and then thoracic surgery um, that assesses the CT scans. We follow um, what were now the modified um, LCAP algor um, algorithm so that you know any nodule that's five millimeters or smaller is background noise and you just get a scan in a year. Um, and when they're six to nine millimeters, then it's a six-month interval scan. We've not seen anybody 
progress to metastatic disease when you follow the six, seven, or eight, nine millimeter nodules. So, um, and those nodules that are larger than 10 millimeters, those are the ones that we assess in our multidisciplinary conference. The majority um, will either get a short interval scan or a biopsy. Um, our interventional radiologists fortunately can do biopsies on small nodules, and obviously we can do a thoracoscopy uh, with a little, little morbidity um, to wedge a peripheral lung nodule, but it's an individual case, and we look at their smoking history, their family history, and you know the, the radiographic characteristics. And you know we were fortunate enough to look at this uh, in my previous life at the University of Cincinnati. And we showed even in the histoplasma belt, you can follow these nodules, and you can limit the number of patients to get a biopsy for an indeterminate pulmonary nodule. And actually, within that trial, you know we had a less than five percent incidence of doing biopsies for um, benign nodules. So, it's doable. Thank you. Um, Dr. Detterbeck, with any screening modality, there's a risk of harms, harms that can occur uh, for a variety of reasons. And so often, physicians and patients think that uh, it, it's appropriate to do screening for anyone and may not appreciate the, the potential downside of screening. Can you educate us a little bit about what the concerns are about screening indiscriminately? Well, I, I think that's a very important, uh, very important point. And I think one of the things that uh, people sometimes fail to recognize is that screening for lung cancer isn't just a test. It's not just a CT scan. It's a whole process, and it's really the interplay of the factors. Do you select the patients that really have high risk? Uh, how do you evaluate the scan? What do you do in follow-up? Do you follow them closely enough? You don't want to intervene too much. You have to balance all that. So, you know, to answer your question more specifically, what are some of the risks? Well, uh, you know, there's radiation associated with screening. Now, the low-dose CT scan that's used is really pretty low dose of radiation, but if you do a lot of follow-up scans, that can start to add up. And so you want to be careful about you know, intervening when you need to, doing follow-up scans when you need to, but not overdoing it. Uh, you know, biopsies are really quite safe in general, but nothing is 100%. And you want to be careful that you're not doing biopsies you don't need to do or that you don't do them in a way for someone that doesn't even have a lung cancer, that just has one of these incidental findings that Dr. Howington pointed out that uh, happens actually quite frequently. If you start chasing all of those, you certainly run the risk of doing some unintentional harm, some uh, collateral damage, if you will, uh, you know, that wasn't intended. And so I think that that interplay is pretty complex and you have to be pretty careful about how you manage that and uh, it's not just a scam. Related to that, uh, some have suggested that the only hard evidence that we have in support of screening is the National Lung Screening Trial, and that the narrow inclusion criteria of the trial are really the only patients that should be considered for screening. Uh, Dr. Darling, I'm, I'm interested in your views of this. Do you think that the National Lung Screening Trial inclusion criteria, that is 55 to 74-year-old patients that have a 30-pack year or more smoking history, uh, is that the only group that should be considered for screening? Are there other patients, other risk factors, like asbestos exposure or COPD or pulmonary fibrosis that ought to be weighed into policy decisions of consideration of lung cancer screening? Doug, I think that's an excellent question, and I think there are other groups that are at increased risk of lung cancer besides those uh, specified in the NSLT. And in addition to things you've mentioned like COPD or fibrosis or asbestos exposure, minors, uh, the other group that is really at high risk for lung cancer are people who have had a previous lung cancer resection. We know that those patients are at increased risk of developing second cancers, about 2% per year, and I think that that group of patients could be included in ongoing screening after they've completed their usual follow-up. 
after their lung cancer surgery. So I want to follow up on that question. I'm going to um, direct this next question uh, to both doctors Howington and Detterbeck uh, uh, because both had very important roles on the American College of Chest Physicians guidelines, uh, the new process that uh, is soon to be published. And I, I know there was some controversy in the screening aspect of those guidelines with at least a public discussion that led to uh, a recommendation of a broadening of criteria that included other patients at risk like Dr. Darling just, represent, just uh, suggested and represented, but then ultimately a, a pullback and a feeling that at least for publication only a desire to recommend screening for patients that fit exactly the NLST criteria. So I'm I'm interested in whether I've interpreted that correctly, uh, what you think the reasons are for that, or if there are important considerations that are uh, relevant for thoracic surgeons to know. Dr. Howington? Yeah, I, well, I think uh, the onerous on the ACCP with the guidelines is it's an evidence-based guidelines, and so they're held to a stricter criteria from a recommendation standpoint of where, where does the evidence lay, and the evidence laid in that specific subset of patients. But I think, you know, as educated physicians, as experienced surgeons who've been managing patients with lung cancers for a number of years, we realize there are subpopulations that we see that get cancer at an earlier age. Patients with prior head and neck cancers would be another group that would fit in the category of screening earlier. Uh, more than one first degree relative, and particularly if those first degree relatives have had cancer before the age of 60, and with our, within our program, they get screened starting at age 50. So, um, but within the uh, contents of the lung cancer guidelines, I, my interpretation was the leadership wanted to uh, confine it to where there was uh, a depth of evidence that there was a benefit. Yeah, to uh, add to that, so, you know, this is a uh, topic that's been discussed quite a bit and uh, debated quite a bit over the uh, two years since the NLST has come out. and. And it's uh, also a moving target. You know, we have more uh, studies being done and some modeling studies and other things that I think are adding uh, data. Um, you know, I think right now really the hard data we have is the NLST criteria. And, you know, there are two other randomized studies that have reported mortality data uh, for CT screening, and actually neither one of them showed a benefit. So. I think we have to be a little bit careful. Now, those were smaller studies, and there are, you know, reasons potentially, and I think we should, you know, view those in context and, and uh, you know, not get, you know, not uh, view them out of proportion. But I think that it should also give us some pause to say that there are a lot of different aspects involved here, and we have to be a little bit careful about jumping the gun and making too many assumptions that we don't really know are true or that we haven't thought through carefully enough or modeled carefully enough to really know where they fit. And uh, I do think we have to be a little bit careful about proceeding, you know, in particular because of this uh, issue that you brought up earlier about, you know, there's a huge potential for benefit, but there's also a potential for harm if we don't do this in a thoughtful and careful way. <clears throat> So I, I appreciate uh, both of your points regarding this. I guess I will provide a little bit of a rebuttal in that although the NLST is very good evidence in a randomized trial, that that's not the only evidence that exists. We also have evidence about asbestos as being a risk factor for lung cancer independent of smoking. We have. COPD is a recognition of an independent risk factor as well as pulmonary fibrosis. So I think those that are creating policy and guidelines, it's important to not be overly restrictive either. One needs to weigh the concern for potential harms of unnecessary testing or screening a broadened group of patients, but we also need to be practical and pragmatic about using the wide degree of evidence that we have, not simply relying upon one study. Dr. Rocco, 
you chaired the Society of Thoracic Surgeons Task Force on Lung Cancer Screening, and you did that at a time that there are already some existing guidelines, uh, guidelines from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, guidelines from the American College of Chest Physicians, etc. As you led the task force from the STS, what were your goals? What did you want to accomplish? And what do you consider some of the main findings of, uh, and main recommendations of the STS task force? Thank you, Doug. Um, the first uh, uh, thing I would, I would like to say is that uh, this task force was uh, uh, could include uh, international members from uh, representing also uh, uh, thoracic uh, surgical societies uh, around the world. And that was a, a true international effort in order to uh, identify and clarify what, what are the criteria for uh, quality and safety in a lung uh, uh, screening trial from the surgical point of view. So we are really focused on uh, uh, the role of thoracic surgeons we, who should be involved uh, early in the design and the structure of the uh, uh, lung uh, cancer screening trials that we focused on the credentialing of these uh, surgeons um, and who should be uh, board certified uh, uh, in the United States or equivalent uh, uh, outside the United States. We uh, um, tried to identify uh, which, which could be the uh, perfect uh, or the uh, 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 ideal um, uh, way to approach um, the false positive uh, uh, issues with lung cancer screening and to minimize the morbidity and we made a very uh, strong I would say uh, uh, pledge for uh, using uh, uh, minimally invasive uh, uh, surgery uh, especially uh, thoracoscopy or robotic whenever uh, this could be uh, available. Um, the uh, idea uh, behind it is that uh, 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 the uh, morbidity and the harms that uh, uh, Frank was referring to can be really reduced if thoracic surgeons are involved in the lung uh, cancer screening programs early and in, a, uh, in, a, in the context of the multidisciplinary team. Thank you. So. One of the things that I'll end with is uh, certainly many groups have uh, now been putting forward guidelines that are going to be impacting policy not only in the, in the United States but also internationally. Uh, I encourage the audience to uh, uh, go to any of these guidelines. Uh, one that I'll recommend certainly because I'm very involved in it is the guidelines of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network which many of you know is a common source of cancer guidelines, including cancer screening guidelines. But I think we've had a robust discussion uh, with our expert panel today uh, about the pros and cons of screening, recognizing the benefits and the, the improvement in lung cancer survival uh, when we screen the right high-risk patients, as well as the potential for harm in, in screening patients that may have uh, not as high a risk for lung cancer and the importance of expertise of the team and rigor of the algorithm of workup of nodules and follow-up protocols to try to improve outcomes of patients that are at risk for developing lung cancer. Thank you.